Chain of infection is the topic of this presentation. We're going to talk about pathogenesis, virulence, factors, host defense mechanisms, um, manifestations of infections, and method of action of antimicrobials. So when we talk about the virulence of the pathogen, again, that's the strength or the potential to cause disease. Um, if they get it in you, will you get sick? Ba basically, that's the, how strong it is. Well, what do we have to project us? We have the host defenses, things that our body, that are in or on our body to protect us. So pathogens, remember, they're trying to find a host, attach and colonize the host and invade it, cause damage, and then survive outside the host. So pathogenicity is the ability of an organism to enter the host and cause disease. The degree of the pathogenicity, that is, the comparative ability to cause disease, is known as virulence. The term pathogenic and non-pathogenic refer to the relative virulence of an organism or its ability to cause disease under certain conditions. This ability not only depends upon the properties of the organism but also upon the ability of the host to defend itself and its immunity and prevent injury. The concept of pathogenicity and virulence has no meaning without relevance or without reference to a specific host. For example, um, gonococcus is capable of causing gonorrhea in humans, but not in lower animals. So again, that reference to a specific host. So microorganisms. Most all the microorganisms that surround us don't cause illness, mainly because they don't have the ability to overcome our, our immune system. We have powerful immune systems. Um, commensal flora, good at surviving on body surfaces, but have little propensity to cause disease unless the host defense is lowered. So this can reflect those patients that um, maybe that we're giving an MDI to. So we encourage those that are getting an inhaled corticosteroid to rinse their mouth out because if a lot of medication is left in the mouth, they can they can get a yeast infection. But uh, and that's that the host site is being lowered because we're adding all this um, all this we're adding this particle that's reducing the host defenses. So what about a strep infection in the skin? Well, how do we prevent that? We try to keep our skin healthy by keeping it um, clean, but also our skin intact and moist and not too dry. Here basically is, it's a battle between good and evil pathogens and their weapons versus our, our weapons. So the human commensal florida, flora is the term given to all natural bacteria that live on the healthy person. So we have about 10 times more of these healthy bacteria living on our body than we do human cells. The major area of colonization are on the skin, the oral cavity, the upper respiratory tract, the lower GI tract, and the urogenital tract. So here we see some of examples of this. Um, this slide isn't really clear, but you really do see we have, depending on where we are, so in the stomach there's um, a large presence of lactobacilli in our in our stomach and lower down in the lower down in the um, in the GI tract are different sorts of bacteria present. So what do what do bacteria do to overcome the host defenses? So this is what are some virulence factors? 
So um, we're going to talk about some of these different virulence factors. So the first one is this ability to form a capsule. This is one of the more common, common things for them to do, and this enables bacteria to avoid or so survive um, phagocytosis. This um, we are immune, uh, um, immunized to protect against some of these um, these capsulated types of organisms. Um, so this is so, something like you would see maybe a spore capsulizes to protect the organism. These can be in either diplococcal or striplococcal findings, so we see these little capsules. Adhesions is another way that another one of these virulence factors or something that the pathogen is going to do to try to break the host defenses. And so adhesion sounds like stick, doesn't it? So basically what these do is bacteriopathogens use, use this to invade. It allows the bacteria to stick to the mucosal lining. Um, so these adhesions are cell surface components or appendages, you could say, of bacteria that facilitate, facilitate this bacterial adhesion or adherence to other cells or in a, in animate objects. So invasiveness is another property. This is that ability of the bacteria to invade the cell. I think of this as when I think of that flesh-eating bacteria, just the term itself, it really shows this high ability to invade the tissue. Um, so disease is produced by invasion of the tissue following this inflammatory process, either through invasion with the um, getting into the pus or um, the granulatomous, that scar tissue growing in the wrong direction. It doesn't give that smooth edge when a when a cut grows together. It's it's more irregular. So remember granuloma is that medical term for a tiny collection of immune cells known as the mac macrophage. Granulomas form when the immune system attempts to wall off a substance that it perceives as foreign but is unable to eliminate it. Um, then we have then Another virulence factor is this exoenzyme. Um, enzymes that are produced or secreted by the bacteria. They can digest or break down. That's if we look at that part of the word, the ACE, A-S-E is to digest or break down. Some of these produce toxins, um, but the, this is another tool that the organism used to produce um, the virulence. There's many different types there, but you look at that collagenase, um, protease, coagulase, you see that commonality there of the ACE to digest or break down. Exoenzymes are enzymes produced within the cell, then released outside of the cell to begin the process of extracellular digestion. So toxins, there's two broad categories of toxins that we're going to talk about. The first one is an exotoxin. Um, exotoxins are usually secreted by bacteria and act at a site to remove, at a site removed from bacterial growth. Whereas um, endotoxins are actually part of the bacteria itself. They're more associated than endotoxins. Think of this as the, this word has one X, where exotoxins has two X's. Exotoxins are related to gram-positive. Endotoxins are related to gram-negative um, organisms and are much more fatal. 
Oh, man. So, how many virulence factors did we co go cover? We just talked about five. Those things that bacteria can do to try to invade the host. They can capsule, they can form adhesions, they can be more invasive, they can form exoenzymes or produce toxins. So those were those five virulence factors we talked about. So again, our host defenses are protect, protection through this normal flora that protects from many of these um, substances. So we have several, um, several host defenses. One is innate or natural immunity. Then we have acquired pneumonia. Im, im, acquired pneumonia, no, acquired immunity, um, tissue, bactericides, and inflammation. So what is innate immunity? The innate is really just saying that's this natural resistance. Um, we have cells in our body that do this um, where phagocytic cells eat toxin producing cells they um, we have these natural killer cells that kind of patrol our body and alert us and produce white blood cells um, we have um, cytokinins a cell that destroy that is destroyed by substance target substance target ab that ab uh, that target abnormal cells so this innate immunity is also known as the non-specific immune system and a secondary secondary line of defense. Um, it compromises cells and mechanisms that defend the host from infection by other organisms in a non-specific manner. So what about anatomic defenses? These are all our natural barriers. So the cilia, the saliva, the tears that are flushed from our eyes, um, the, um, the more non-specific immune releases, um, or specific immune immunities that we have in our body so the skin, which is obviously a natural, natural barrier to many things. The phagocytic cells, there are um, three macrophages in the lungs. Um, Phagocytes, again, are the white blood cells that protect the body by ingesting the harmful foreign particles, the bacteria, and the dead or dying cells. So remember, that's to eat or to, to devour. If we looked at that um, term from, microbi or from medical terminology, they are essential for fighting infections and for subsequent immunity. One liter of human blood contains about six, billion phago six billion phagocytes. So these are the, the those that are released, the neutrophils, monocytes, and macrophage. Then we have these cells that are released, cells that release inflammatory mediators. So basophils, mast cells, eosinophils, is another part of our immunity. We have natural killer cells play a major role in, in host rejection of both tumors and um, virally infected cells. Natural killer cells are cytotoxic. This is the this it, it is the quality of being toxic to cells. Um, upon release in close proximity to a cell slated for killing another one. Um, they serve to contain viral infections while adaptive immune response is generating anti-specific cyto 
toxic T cells that can clear the infection. So they work together with others. Um, pathocytic defense. Um, phagocytes are the class of cells which are capable of ingestion or destruction of microorganisms. Um, so infl inflammation recruits these phagocytes to that site where there is the inflammation. Um, these, we call them kind of professional phagocytes, are the neutrophils and macrophages. So that's where we'll look at those um, when we're looking at lab values to, s to see the extent of the body's response um, to an infection. Antimicrobial substances in host cells. So body fluids and tissues contain a variety of antimicrobial agents that kill or inhibit growth of microbes such as interferons, intraleukins, and lysosomes. Lysosome will rupture the bacteria. Interleukins can target certain disease. Interferons are proteins made and released by host cells in response to the presence of pathogens. So they allow communication between cells to trigger the protective defenses of the immune system. So really important things here. Um, so a complement system is the role of inflammation and patho, um, pathocytosis. So it's a complement trigger inflammation and phagocytosis. Um, this complement system helps or complements the ability of antibodies and phagocytic cells to clear pathogens from organisms. And there's these nine major components that are referred to as C1 through C9. Um, that help this generation of the inflammatory um, inflammation factors. When stimulated by one of several trig triggers, protease in the system um, will release these cytokinins and initiate and amplify a cascade of further release of anti-inflammatory um, factors. So the inflammatory response then, kind of leading up to this, is also part of this innate immunity. Chemicals including histamine, bradykinin, um, serotonin, and others are released by this damaged tissue. These chemicals cause blood vessels to leak fluid into the tissues resulting in a localized swelling. This helps isolate that, for, that foreign substance and, and help remove it. So. Um, so again, inflammation is part of this complex biological response of uh, vascular or, or where there's blood flow to the tissues to harmful stimuli such as pathogens, damaged cells, or irritation. Inflammation is a protective attempt by the organism to remove the injurious stimuli and initiate the healing process. Inflammation is not a synonym for infection, even in cases where inflammation is caused by infection. Although infection is caused by microorganisms, inflammation in, is one of the responses of the organism to the pathogen. However, inflammation is a stereotyped response and therefore sometimes um, used that term is used inappropriately with infection. So, done with innate immunity, now on to other immunity. So our innate immunity then we talked about was the anatomic, the phagocytic, the cells that in release those inflammatory mediators, the natural killer cells, the complement system, and the cytokinins. So that's our innate immunity. Now, what about acquired immunity? This is what is acquired as we are exposed to various agents. Um, so either 
immunity acquired by infection that we've had previously or a vaccination or we get active um, immunity or by the transfer of an antibody or lymphocyte from an immune donor so we can, can have this passive immunity. This changes over life so we you can kind of think about if a boy was raised in a bubble they would not have a have acquired any of this acquired pneumonia um, immunity. So what about manifestations of infection? How do you know you are sick? You might have a low um, red blood cells or an increase in white blood cells. Um, there might be a coagulation issue. So the heart rate is going to increase and then maybe go down. The blood pressure might vary. So all sorts of different manifestations of infection depending on where this is occurring and yet some of the symptoms are very the same. Most infections are going to increase the pulse rate and body temperature but others may not do that. So typhoid fever, for example, um, doesn't increase the heart rate where um, you know where pneumonia will. Um, we can see some hypotension that occurs with patients with septic shock. We might see hyperventilation in patients that have an infection. This can alter sensorium, and this is especially more true when elderly, when severe infection um, is present, regardless, regardless of whether or not the CNS is infected or not. So fever um, may cause may be caused by an infection or it might not be caused by an infection, may be intermittent or not. Um, our body temperature tends to be warmer in the afternoon than it is first thing in the morning, but fever is the body's natural defense against illness, both bacterial and viral. The fact is that fever help us battle the illness. Research Researchers believe that turning up the heat is the body's way of fighting germs and making the body less comfortable place for them. Um, so there are certain people that say don't don't treat the fever because the fever is there to try to make the body less hospitable to these organisms. However, uh, with a high fever, one can develop seizures. So most of the time the number is 104. If a temperature is over 104, it's recommended to take an over-the-counter fever reducer like acetaminophen. Okay, that's the end of this lecture. It's basically a lot of different terms that um, we're going to want to know the category of where they fit in. Again, going back to thinking about being able to define pathogenesis, listing some of those virulence factors, some of the host defense mechanisms, how an infection manifests, and that is what we covered.